Okay, so obviously today you'll be aware that we're here to talk about the humanities and Black Lives Matter and how we can make our curriculum really diverse and inclusive. Um, we've got four guest speakers today um, who are going to talk about the different disciplines within humanities. Um, the rationale for this session really is off the back of Lorraine Hughes' session that she delivered yesterday. Um, if you didn't manage to see that session, that will be available on YouTube, um, on the Chilton TSA YouTube channel. Um, and there were some really key ideas that came off the back of that. Um, she talked about young people as the agents of lasting change in our society. You know, this idea that young people are going to change the future that we live in. Uh, and I think as educators, we have, really have a responsibility to make sure that that is the case. Um, she also said if a uh, diverse curriculum is to succeed, we all have to have a part in it. Um, there is concurrent sessions going on with English um, and different departments. Um, and obviously this has got to be a whole school and a whole trust and a whole town wide approach really. Um, so as I've said today, we're going to have myself. Uh, I'm Adam Holdsworth based at Denby High School in Luton. Um, I'm a specialist leader of education for religious education um, and obviously based within the Chiltern Learning Trust. Um, we've got Ian Hayden from Denby High School, who, who is also a specialist leader of education, who will be talking about geography. And um, we've got Jen Mills, um, who is a history specialist. She's assistant head teacher at Chorley High School for Girls. And we've got Henry Cross as well from Chorley High School for Boys, um, who is associate his assistant head teacher, humanities lead, um, but also a history specialist. So the aims of today's session, first of all, we want to create a dialogue. This shouldn't just be a standalone session. This shouldn't be just be something that we deliver one session on and leave that behind. This should, should form an ongoing dialogue. Um, I know I've spoken to different people um, across Luton and the idea is that this group will hopefully be able to meet regularly and discuss and um, share ideas. Um, it's to encourage reflection and we want teachers to reflect on their practice and planning and really review their curriculums to make sure that they're appropriate for uh, the learners that they're teaching um, and hopefully as well to give some practical ideas about how um, we've been doing this and how that Black Lives Matter and diverse curriculum ideas um, can manifest, manifest themselves in humanity subjects. So I'm going to start off by talking to, to you a little bit about Ari. Um, if there is any questions that you have as we go, you can use the chat box for those questions. But there will also be um, that time at the end to where, I, as I said, I will open the floor to questions. Um, our facilitators, our speakers are in the chat box now. So some of the questions they may answer just in the chat box. Um, other questions they may save and pick them up at the end. <clears throat> okay, so the first sort of idea that I picked out for RE is ensuring a broad and decolonized curriculum. Um, the, we the word decolonization has been bandied around a lot recently. Um, and essentially what that means is that we change the guys that we teach from. Traditionally, RE has been taught through white Christian guys, you know, from a white Christian perspective. Whereas actually we need to strip that away, we need to strip that back to think about how we are looking at our curriculum. There is a big push um, for those of you who are involved in you know, EduChat and um, a lot of the discussion online about RE moving towards a world views curriculum. What world views means is essentially people looking at views other than maybe the six major world religions. People may be looking at the gray areas in between religion as well. Um, I think in the past RE has fallen into the trap of just teaching from the six major world faiths and just teaching maybe a lot more generally that all groups of people believe a certain thing when actually there's a lot more nuance and a lot more grey areas in and around that. So we need to make sure that as teachers we're not narrowing the curriculum of religions that is taught at GCSE and at Key Stage a big part of this as well is going to be challenging underlying narratives. When I talk about narratives, generally that means people's misconceptions about the way a group is or the way a group behaves. Um, I'm going to use an example in a second, which I think is appropriate to Luton. Um, 
obviously different locations and different contexts would maybe have different issues that they would have to address and deal with. Um, obviously narratives and underlying narratives can be d dangerous and can divide society. So narrative one that we, we share with our pupils is that Islam is taking over Europe. This is a narrative that is generally played out and believed by far right groups in Luton, you know, the birthplace of the EDL. And, you know, they're peddling this narrative that Islam is out there to take over Europe, to, you know, turn Britain into an Islamic state. You know, they cite that, you know, these terrorist attacks are actually, you know, Islam's way of taking over Britain. The counter narrative of that is that the West is at war with Islam that Britain and the UK want to destroy Islam. The danger of this is that our pupils come to believe that actually the world is very black and white, that these narratives are, you, you've got to either believe a narrative one or narrative two. Essentially, these narratives are propaganda. And I think the really important thing is if we're going to, if we're going to try and make sure that our curriculums are diverse and that RE is diverse and, and contextually appropriate is that we strip away these narratives and say well actually the people who believe these narratives are in a massive minority and actually there is a massive void in the middle of that where most people fit in and most people can be tolerant and accepting of both groups of people and then it's also important, I think, as RE teachers to think about where do these narratives come from? Where are our pupils getting this information? Where are our pupils engaging with the information that they get? One of those is the mainstream media. Um, and particularly when we look at, um, you know, obviously the examples here, like the Daily Express, the Sun, Daily Mail, can quite often peddle quite racist ideas and can quite often stoke up a lot of hatred. You know, I'll just give you a second to look over some of the headlines there, but if this is what our pupils are being exposed to every single day, when they're in the shops or when they're clicking on their phones or looking at news, this stokes up these narratives, this stokes up that hatred. The other side of this that our pupils probably more commonly are engaging in is social media. Um, when I was looking at putting together some ideas for this session, I was reading an article about Wilfred Zaha, who plays for Crystal Palace, um, who received um, really abusive messages and images over Instagram. Um, and on the back of that, police have arrested a 12-year-old boy in connection with this. It is really important as teachers and really important within the subject of RE that we educate our pupils about the information that they are they are getting hold of. You know, that boy has obviously received that information from somewhere, be that through social media or be that through mainstream media. But this idea that pupils and, and young people can hide behind a screen and be immune to this is obviously need, needs to be addressed. And then the next sort of aspect I, I was looking at is about celebrating diversity. Um, I remember th this sort of idea goes back to a few years ago, I was on a course and someone, someone said to me, I, I was talking about the context of my school. So for those of you who don't know Denby, we're probably over 90% Asian Muslim pupils. And this person said to me, how do you teach your pupils about homosexuality? How do, you, how do you teach them to be tolerant? And actually, I said to them, the bare minimum we should expect from our students is tolerance. And I think as teachers, we need to set really, really high expectations of our pupils. And actually, on reflection, I think we should probably ex be expecting more than tolerance. I think we should be moving to the point where we are celebrating diversity. We are celebrating difference in our town and in our, in our um, schools.
the word tolerance to me you see, almost feels like you're putting up with someone that you you tolerate someone because you have to because you're being told that that's the way you've got to think when actually we should be encouraging our pupils to celebrate diversity um, to, to the point where we should be celebrating Luton as a town. The ways we can do that is I think we need to be engaging with the local community. We need to be looking at different maybe faith groups, different organisations that are peddling and, and pushing for diversity in town. I know in Luton we have Luton Carnival, which really celebrates diversity. Uh, in our school, we've had lots of visitors coming in and promoting the local community, promoting people from all different backgrounds um, in order to celebrate that diversity of our town. OK, um, we're now going to move on to our second speaker. As I said, if there's any questions about RE, um, you can put them into the chat box. Um, and at the end, we're going to have the section on Q&A. Um, so I'm going to unshare my screen and our next speaker is going to be Ian Hayden, who's going to talk to you about geography. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, so my name's Ian Hayden. I'm the teaching and learning leader uh, for geography at Denby High School. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is an inclusive geography curriculum. But before I start that, I think obviously it's really important for me to state that I'm a white man. Um, I haven't experienced systematic racism or systematic discrimination in my life. And so everything I say um, for the next 15 minutes is going to be uh, through that lens. So for me, um, my journey started um, with the CTSA Edu chat on Black Lives Matter and anti-racism. And this was, um, you know, it's really quite a complex um, webinar with lots of ideas that were presented. And I, and I had to watch it a, a few times to unpick the, the messages in it. But there were four things that, that really struck me um, that, that were being said by people in this uh, webinar. And so the first thing came from the Chartered Teaching College. And they were kind of laying out a roadmap for how we can move forward with this idea of an inclusive anti-racist curriculum. And their roadmap was that we should learn, we should reflect on what we're doing, and then we should act. But that change needs to be sustainable. And I, and I think in my opinion, to make the change sustainable, that's ensuring that the changes we introduce into our curriculum are not tokenistic. The second point I got from this chat was that there was scope within the national curriculum to teach a range of experiences from different groups of people, but that there may be some conflict with exam specifications and exam specifications may not have this scope. And I thought, well, that's something I want to look at. Are the exam specifications so limiting that we cannot teach sort of anti-racist or more inclusive narratives? And I also thought that may be a common concern amongst teachers. So again, it was something I wanted to look at. The third point um, is what narratives are in our textbooks, in our lesson materials, and what are the potential impacts of these narratives? And again, I think it's looking through those um, in a more sort of inclusive or anti-racist lens. And then the fourth point, and this was the one that perhaps had the most resonance for me, was there are not many non-white experiences in the curriculum and often they're only in token months. And so therefore our curriculum is not aspirational. So, you know, I, I went to point number one and I thought, okay, the first thing I do is I'm gonna try and learn about these issues. Um, and so I thought a good place to start would be the subject associations. So I went onto the Royal Geographical Society's webpage and read their statement on Black Lives Matter. And this is what they said. So the society stands in solidarity with black communities globally against racism and inequality and joins the global calls to reaffirm that Black Lives Matter following the shocking and tragic death of George Floyd. We recognize that geography has a long and complicated history in relation, in relation to racial oppression, including instances where it has contributed directly and note the use of the past tense there. Um, the society was founded in 1830. The, the society's status as a leading UK institution emerged from the structures of imperialism and colonialism. 
So I thought it was good that, that they recognize that geography has an imperial past, and that is important for all geography teachers to, to know. Um, but there isn't much there about how we move forward, and certainly nothing about what we can actually do in the classroom. So then I went over to the GA and I had a look what they had to say. So this is their statement. Geography has a distinct role in relation to these issues. The establishment and growth of geography in schools in the UK during the 19th and 20th centuries were closely associated with the activities and ambitions of the British Empire. Today, in its 21st century incarnation, our subject has much to contribute to building understanding and connections between individuals and communities and cultures within our society and peoples across the world. So again, you know, recognition of, of the colonial imperial past of the subject, a little bit on the direction of how we move forward, but nothing that I as a classroom teacher can actually implement. But I think kind of going back to the things that I was trying to address as a curriculum lead, there, there is another point here, um, a fifth point that I need to think about, and that is that we do need to acknowledge the imperial and colonial history of the subject. And if I just quickly uh, get back to this, it's especially important as on the RGS's website, there's a resource on traveling um, through Africa for students aged eight to 13. So, you know, key stage two, key stage uh, three resource. Um, and in it, it's still got information on Sir Henry Morton Stanley. Now, for those of you who don't know him, he was the first person to map Lake uh, Victoria, but he was also an, an appalling racist and, and, and committed some atrocious acts um, against uh, native African peoples in, at the end of the 19th century. But there's no mention of that. There's no counter narrative within those classroom materials. Um, so again, you know, those narratives are reinforcing uh, sort of a exclusive rather than inclusive curriculum. Now, the second point, the second take home I got from, from this CTSA chat was that there's scope within the national curriculum to teach experiences of a range of people. So again, I went back to the national curriculum. Uh, I really like the national, the key stage three national curriculum for geography. I think it's very well written. I like that the purpose of study is very broad. So, so this is the purpose of study. Teaching should equip pupils with knowledge about diverse places, people, resources, and natural and human environments, together with a deep understanding of the Earth's key physical and human processes. Now that provides us with a lot of scope of what we can actually teach and how we implement that in Denby. So this is our curriculum. We've got a two year key stage three. So year seven, uh, we're looking at global scale issues. So geography of my place, tectonics, weather and climate, biomes, population and development. And within those, we do look at issues of colonialism and how that contributes to the development gap and how it contributes to population growth. Um, and then in year eight, we focus more on a regional scale. And so we've got the human and physical geography of China, uh, the Middle East and Russia, Africa and the UK. And again, within those schemes of work, within those schemes of learning, uh, we're addressing stereotypes on, about Africa and addressing stereotypes about the other places around the globe. But of course, there's absolutely more we, we can do. But due to the time constraints of this session, I'm not going to present my key stage three ideas. Um, because I think the key stage four and the exam specifications may not having the scope to teach these narratives is perhaps a more pressing issue for a lot of um, sort of key stage four teachers. So what I'm going to do for the next few slides is talk about um, our exam specification, which is Geography at XLB and talk about ways that I think we can inc incorporate these more inclusive narratives within our kind of exam preparation lessons. Now, obviously, I know that it is not all about the exam, but I'm simply presenting ideas about how we can make those exam lessons more inclusive and hopefully more engaging and aspirational as well. So I'm going to talk about um, migration to the UK, and, I, and I've chosen this topic intentionally because it's a, a topic that's in most exam specs in, in some form. This is the knowledge the students need taken directly from the exam spec. So the UK economy and society is increasingly linked and shaped by the wider world. And in terms of what students actually need to know, the details of that, why has national and international migration over the past 50 years altered the population geography of the UK? 
and how have UK and EU immigration policies contributed to increasing ethnic and cultural diversity? A typical exam question you may get. So explain one reason why major cities attract large numbers of international migrants. Now, what I, what I did with this, I then went to the textbook and looked at the information that the textbook was presenting on this. I haven't, edit, you know, I haven't edited this in any way, apart from cropping out the things that were not impacts of international migration. Now, this is a textbook that was published in 2016. And I'm not trying to be polemical here, but the, well, I'll read this information out to you first. So generally, international migrants settle in and, and around cities, providing a new source of both cheap or unskilled and skilled labour. OK, so migration to cities increases population density and puts pressure on services. Fine, but that's all migration to cities. Why is that under the international migration heading? Third point, as many migrants are young and have families, this increases the number of children in an area and affects population demographics in ageing populations such as the UK. This can also bring benefits. Doesn't tell us what those benefits are. And then the only clear advantage I can see from, from this textbook writer's perspective is that migrants introduce their home culture, for example, cuisine and religious practices. So there's negatives about increasing and putting pressure on services. But, you know, the, the benefits are I can go to Chinatown on Friday and get a bowls or a shreja or something. And that's the only benefit of it. And for me, that is not uh, an aspirational na narrative. That's quite restrictive and reinforces perhaps pre-held um, convictions about migration. So what I then did is tried to think about, okay, well, the, the fourth point in this is that there are not many non-white experiences in the curriculum. And so how can I include non-white experiences within that migration unit and still make it relevant to the exam specification. And so I went on to the Black Curriculum website and um, uh, you know, their aims are to kind of reimagine the, uh, the curriculum through black history. And it is, the website is mostly focused on history, but of course there's a lot of crossover between history and geography. And so on their website, they've got some, some fantastic resources about Olive Morris. So Olive Morris was born in 1952, migrated from Jamaica to London, and the migration of her and her parents was a direct result of post-war immigration policy, which of course is a key piece of knowledge that most geography students need to know. Uh, Olive experienced severe violence and racism from police and from the white community, but she responded to that in an incredibly uh, brave and sort of heroic almost way. She became involved in politics and challenged racism at a very young age, uh, 17, I believe. Also, kind of as, as an aside, in 1977, she traveled to China. Now, that was one year after the Cultural Revolution. So she must have been one of the first people to go into China after that period where China was effectively shut off from the world. And again, I think that's something that we could really investigate in our Key Stage um, 3 curriculum. But moving back to the Key Stage 4, um, she established the Brixton Black Women's Group, which was a support network that cam campaigned for fairer housing and education rights for minority ethnic women. Um, so if we go back to this exam question, it says explain one reason why major cities attract large numbers of international migrants. If you have a look at the mark scheme, so we've got kind of the standard answer that you would expect at the top there. So there's lots of high paid professional jobs uh, because lots of transnational corporations have headquarters in major cities. And that would be probably the answer we would expect. We look at the bottom point here likely to find familiar stuff because major cities have existing international and cultural communities now within that mark scheme i think it would be perfectly valid to talk about how in cities there are support networks for example the bricks and black women's group that would be a mark uh, who helped uh, ethnic minority women campaign for housing and education rights. That's the second mark. And again, I know it's not all about the exams, but this is a more aspirational narrative than what was in the textbook that I showed you. Um, and it's perfectly valid for exam knowledge as well. In terms of how to teach this, um, so the blackcurriculum.com, it's got, it's got some you know really good resources on there. We've got kind of short videos um, about 
uh, inspirational figures from ethnic minorities, and they've got kind of quizlets with key words, and they've got reflective pieces um, as well. So I guess for me, you know, this this is a constant process, and I'm I'm at the beginning of my journey, and I've, and I've got other examples, but due to time constraints, I'm, I'm not going to talk about those other examples now. But for me, this is going to be an iterative process. I've got some ideas about how we can do it, but I'm really kind of hoping to, to start a conversation, I guess, and, and see if I can refine these thought processes uh, and make our curriculum more inclusive. So, yeah, that's it for me. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Ian. Um as I said, any questions for any of our guests today, you can either add them into the chat box at the top uh, and we'll pick them up at the end, or we can do a bit of live Q&A at the end as well. Um, next, we've got um, Henry Cross, who's going to talk about history. OK, good morning, everybody. Just going to start to share my presentation with you. Adam, can you see that? Yeah, that's working. Wonderful. Uh, so, yeah, so my name is Henry Cross. Um, I'm head of humanities at Shawnee Boys School. Um, predominantly, I'm a, I'm a history specialist, but I do teach RE as well. So I'm just going to give you a bit of context about the school that I work in to begin with, because I think when you come to do any kind of curriculum design, um, you, you really do need to take the context of your school into consideration. So we've got just over a 1,000 boys at our school. It is an all-boys school, um, state comprehensive from 11 to 16. Uh, just under a third of our students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, we've got a really high proportion of students there, EAL. Um, and we have got a mixed intake of students, but predominantly they are from Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin. Uh, and a very large Muslim culture. So that's the context of the school that I work in. Um, and what I'm gonna to try to do today is talk a little bit about why an inclusive curriculum is important for our students. And I'm gonna to try to show you some practical examples of how you can uh, make your curriculum more inclusive potentially. Um, do, first, do you mind just pressing present so we can make the slides a little bit bigger? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, Okay, so first of all, what, what does this, you know, what does this mean to my team? Um, so first of all, it's um, it actually representing the past as, as it actually was. Um, you know, it's not about teaching inclusive curriculum for the sake of inclusive, inclusivity. It's actually just good history and showing students what it actually was like. Um, and secondly, you know, curriculum, as we know, is constantly evolving. Um, and it's something you need to reassess every year to take stock to ensure that actually you are telling the most representative story you possibly can. Um, and history, especially, is, you know, it's a battleground and interpretations, perceptions of the past are changing all of the time. So it's really it's so important to keep up to date with that. Um, and also, thirdly, um, massively important to include as many different perspectives as possible. So this could be, you know, groups, um, themes, religions, races. Um, if you don't provide different perspectives, then you're not going to give people a real um, view of what the world was actually like. So, um, this is something that was shared by Christian Council at the School History Project um, session last weekend. And for those of us that uh, obviously study history in Key Stage 3, it should look quite familiar. And, um, you know, my own experience of history when I was a student was, was very similar to this. Um, and actually, for many history teachers still today, you know, you might be looking at and thinking, well, I, I, you know, I still taught, teach an awful lot of that. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and a lot of us, I think, that is a kind of starting point. But... You know, there are some real issues with this, I think, um, in the fact that there's, you know, there's not really any focus on, on, on women's history. Um, when, they, when, when you teach you about um, black history, you've only got a focus on the slave trade. Well, well what, what kind of perspective is that giving our students if they're studying black history and that's their own experience? Um, when you're looking at um, Jewish history, own experience, the Holocaust, you know, it, it, you can't expect students to have perspective um, if you don't give them a range of history to study. Uh, and also, for me, really importantly as well, is that it's entirely European-centric. And we've got a kind of history of just teaching European history and American history um, with very little world history. So, but I mean, I think the thing is, is obviously uh, not to panic, especially if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, that looks very familiar, because because curriculum is, is a journey and it, it takes time to, to transition, to change um, what we're doing to make it more representative. So... Um, it's just important about, I think, making a start. So with that in mind, I'm just going to share with you a few kind of very traditional topics that I think all history teachers still teach and just give you a, a kind of more inclusive slant in it, basically, to try to inform your teaching. Um, so all of us and teach about Henry VIII, that I would imagine, and about his struggle with the Catholic Church, um, you know, the break with Rome and the dissolution of monasteries. 
Um, you know, it's a very traditional approach and the students enjoy it. Um, but something that I only found out actually about three or four weeks ago um, was actually kind of a byproduct of this reformation. Uh, was a law passed by Henry VIII in 1533 called the Buggery Acts. Um, and this essentially um, outlawed homosexuality. Um, the, prior to this, it was, it was, I think it's fair to say it was, it was seen more of a, as a social crime, a moral crime, but it wasn't, it wasn't, anything, it wasn't anything strictly enforced as a punishment necessarily. Um, and actually these kind of um, crimes as they were seen then were dealt with by the ecclesiastical courts, so the church courts. Um, but Henry VIII determined to remove the authority of the Catholic Church and undermine them as much as possible. He decided to create this as a state law just to undermine the Catholic Church. He didn't really have any strong feelings on homosexuality. Um, and yet the consequence of this is that you know, hundreds of um, homosexuals executed under this law uh, for hundreds of years. Uh, and it wasn't until 1861 that this law was actually um, abolished. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a stunning bit of evidence to actually look at that period as a, as a real, you know, from a different lens. <laughs> Um, something else that we, you know, all teach, or imagine or most of us teach at Keys to Three or Keys to Four is Elizabeth I. Um, and again, the kind of traditional representation is focusing on Elizabeth's relationship with her powerful male courtiers and also looking at her relationship with Europe. And, and you know, for good reason. I'm not saying that these are um, not interesting or, or important things to teach. Um, because obviously, the relationship with, with Spain and, and France and Catholicism versus Protestantism is, is very important. But Again, particularly if you're teaching at Key Stage 3 and you don't want to repeat, obviously, what you're doing in Key Stage 4, um, there are alternatives, you know, you can, um, you, you can look at Elizabeth's relationship with, with women in her life. And I've started to read Tracy Borman's book and it's, it, I'd really recommend it. It's so, um, it's so well written. Um, but also you can look at the relationship between Elizabeth and the Islamic world, um, which, you know, I've, I don't think I've either really ever heard of before. Um, if you'd asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have known. But, um, you know, from 1558, when she became queen, um, she was immediately set about um, making links with uh, the Moroccan emirs, the, the Ottoman Empire, the Persian Empire, because essentially England was, you know, ostracized from European society because um, we were a Protestant nation and, and the rest of Europe were Catholic. And, you know, we've, we've got kind of our very own Brexit hashed out again 450 years ago, where England is kind of separated, isolated, desperate for allies, uh, for military protection, commercial ties. And so you've actually got 250 tons, for example, of sugar arriving from Morocco every year in England, um, blackening Elizabeth's teeth. Um, and you've got English money then funding uh, the Moroccans in their wars against the Spanish and the Portuguese, so essentially paying for um, Islamic empires to fight and kill Christian soldiers. Um, and actually, it was far safer for Englishmen to go and do business and, and, and go and visit these Islamic empires than it was to visit mainland Europe, because um, they could have quite easily been caught and arrested as a spy, as a Protestant spy. Um, and Elizabeth, even to cultivate favour with these Islamic rulers, um, was at pains to make the, the point that Protestantism and Islam were actually not that different from each other. Um, and almost to cultivate that they were more similar than Protestantism and Catholicism. So, you know, it's a really rich, interesting period of history, which um, is, is largely untaught, I'd say. Uh, and, and if you want to find a bit more about a really interesting story about a, a man called Samson Rowley, I'd suggest you just Google him, but I'll just give you kind of a context. So he's, he's an Englishman from Bristol, and he goes on a, a trade mission from England to, um, I think he's bound for the Ottoman Empire, and his uh, ship gets captured on the way, gets captured by Turkish pirates, um, they castrate him, uh, take him back to um, the Ottoman Empire, where he converts to Islam, um, changes his name, um, and works his way up to become the tre uh, chief eunuch and treasurer of the city of Algiers, uh, lives in a palace, and um, about 10 years after he's been there, we're very happy, by the way, um, some English ambassadors approach him and, and kind of you know, say, say, well, you know, we, we think you're still, we, we believe if you still say you're a Protestant, you can come back with us if you want. And he's like, well, we want to come back. <laughs> I own a palace. Um, but just just a really rich history that we can we can make relevant to our students. Um, thirdly, I, I hope many of you saw. I hope some of you saw this on Facebook or some other social media websites. So this is Michael Holding in the top right, who's next cricketer, and he gave a really impassioned. I put the link there if you haven't seen it. A really impassioned, moving speech um, about racial inequality and his own views on it. And um, and I, I think he's he's bang on, and he talks a lot about religious symbolism, but he also talks about the industrial revolution and. I learned about the Industrial Revolution, I think most of us did, a lot of us still teach it. And I know that Thomas Edison, on the left there, invented the light bulb. Um, you know, I've had quiz questions on it this, uh, this, um, during lockdown, tick, got it right. And I know the guy on the right-hand side, Alexander Graham Bell, invented the telephone. I've never heard of Louis Lassima, um, to my shame. And it might be that there's other history teachers out there that aren't as ignorant as I am. Um, but I think there's nothing wrong with that. So Louis Lassima actually 
Um, Thomas Edison created a paper filament for the first light bulb, which wasn't particularly efficient uh, or bright. And Louis Lassman created a carbon filament for it instead, um, which was much more efficient um, and cost-effective, good to use um, widespread. He also uh, painted the blueprints for the first telephone for Alexander Graham Bell, and yet yeah, I've never heard of him. Um, and, and there's something wrong with that. And actually, when we look at black history or any history, we've got to just through kind of research and subject knowledge, you can integrate it into your curriculum without having to kind of to uh, this tokenistic approach where you've got a unit solely on black history and you can integrate it all together. And this is kind of a good example of how you can do that. Um, and finally, um, something that I was, I just wanted to share, and I haven't really got solutions to it, but it's just something that I thought was quite uh, interesting and, and maybe a bit uncomfortable as well. Um, and I started some co a conversation with some colleagues at Chorney and we talked about the power of language and what, what do you think of, for example, when you think of plantation? And when I think of plantation, it is pretty much exactly what I can see when I Googled it as images. I think of a big farmhouse with pillars, um, you know, and because I'm a history teacher, I do, I think of slaves picking cotton. But, but, but is that really what we want them to, to see or imagine? Is that how it really was? Um, no. Um, you know, at the very least, these were labour camps. Um, at the very worst, you could describe these as concentration camps. And yet there's something wrong with that language, I think. Um, and if I just to express that, you know, I, I Googled concentration camps instead, and you've got completely different images there to what you think of plantations. Um, and I was actually, I was talking about this further with some friends last night, actually, and um, talk about, for example, you know, where, for example, the players are working on the plantations. It's, it's, it's hot, it's warm, it's sunny, and it maybe it cultivates that, that that image in your head is, is kind of like a, like a almost like a holiday if you like because of that and when you contrast that with like the concentration camps in eastern europe and it's very cold it's snowy it's kind of brutal conditions the russian gulags maybe that also contributes to that that language and that image that comes up in your head but there's something really very very wrong with that i think and i haven't got any solutions to it but um it's something that we're actively engaging with in in our faculty for, for how to tackle when we teach you next year um i mean with, with slavery as a unit we all i think you know we all teach slavery and um, certainly what I've heard and read in the last year in particular is it's moving in the right direction, the way we teach this, which is that we're not teaching it in the way that Britain and William Wilberforce kind of handed um, uh, the slaves their, free, their, their freedom. Actually, we're focusing on you know, the Haiti Rebellion. Uh, we're focusing on Equiano, uh, Ignatius, um, Sancho, and how they, they won their freedom, which is, which is the correct way um, you know, to teach it if you want to do it in, in a positive and inclusive way. Um, and I think, I think that what underpins all of this um, is reading and research. Uh, so I've just put on there some of the books that I'm, I've read or I'm in the process of reading uh, this year. Uh, Fergus is, is on now recommended Sugar in the Blood to me, which I'm, I'm just, uh, I've, I've purchased and started to read now, a brilliant read. But if you don't do this, um, you know, you're never really going to move your, you know, your history, your curriculum forward. Um, and I think if you, even if you could pick one thing you want to change on your curriculum for next year, you, you do kind of want to sit down in the department, pick a book, um, and, and, and do that. And, and I'm very fortunate that the people that work with me are you know, hugely enthusiastic and always recommending books and things to read. But unless you do this, if you don't know these things, because I think it's, it's not that history teachers don't want to teach an inclusive curriculum. I think it's they don't know, um, um, which is quite understandable. Um, you know, I think you, you can probably feel my pain, <laughs> those who do teach history, that you know, there's kind of expectation, unrealistic expectation that because you're a history teacher, you know all history. And uh, you know, I've been in lots of quizzes since the lockdown. And if you get history question one, well, they're kind of, yeah, you must be a rubbish history teacher. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's just so much. And um, but you, you do need to make time to, to do that. Um, so I'm just sharing now with you, this is, this is our key stage three curriculum at 20 Boys School. Um, and it's obviously by no means a model curriculum. And like I said already, it's always a work in progress and, and we've still got things to do. Um, but I'm just going to talk to you about some of the things I've highlighted in green there. Um, so it's very different from what I did like a couple of years ago. Um, but essentially, we, we believe that students and people will attend to things that they value. And, you know, people tend to value things that they've got some prior knowledge about already. Uh, and they tend to value things that uh, they think matter to them. So bearing in mind the context of our students, we introduced some new units based on Asiatic and Islamic history. So it was year seven, also awesome one look at the most significant turning point in Islamic empire. And here they focus on um, the Rashidan Caliphate, they look at the Abbasid Caliphates and the Golden Age of Islam. And they finish with Salah and the and the Crusades. And that was a really important unit for us because um, we did some student surveys uh, last year. And our students came back and said to us that we, you know, we enjoyed learning about the Crusades, but 
why are we learning about it just from a Christian perspective? And, uh, and we thought, yeah, fair enough. What, why are you? Um, so, so we took that on board and, and, and looked at it a bit differently. And I think the point I want to make with this and about, and about the importance of world history is that if you kind of teach this narrow European centric history, um, the students, you do, I think we're doing such a disservice because they're not learning about the world how it actually was. And England and indeed Europe for hundreds of years was considered that kind of very insignificant, like, you know, bit part plays in like world politics and economy for, for such a long time. Um, and it would be the equivalent of kind of 500 years from now, us looking back at this kind of period um, and not teaching anything about China or, or America. You, you wouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, that is, that is what we are doing a lot of the time. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. Um, the second thing I just wanted to focus on um, was the Tudor units. We've just changed this for this year. And this is, I think, quite a good way of how you can not deviate like, enormously from the content you're already teaching. A lot of us teach the Tudors, but just give it a different focus. So with how did the Tudor queens influence religion in England, um, we focus on three queens. We focus on Queen Anne Boleyn, which is kind of a, a crucial one because you know, we look at the influence, the impact she had on Henry VIII and how he, she kind of convinced him to break from the church with Rome, um, which is massive. Um, and then we also look at Queen Mary um, the first and Elizabeth the um, first. So, you know, quite traditional content, but from a female uh, viewpoint. Uh, and then the second, th and so as we go through in year seven, another new unit this year, um, which has been loads of great CPD on um, since since the lockdown. Uh, Nick Dennis, I've watched some of his CPD, and it's, it's, been, it's a great new online textbook, free textbook on West African civilization. And, and like I said, unless these things kind of exist and are freely available, it's very difficult to build your subject knowledge, but I think that's there now. So we've got a new unit called, um, so why did West Africa become globalized in the 1300s? Um, and again, it's, it's, it's hugely important because, you know, we, before this, we only taught the slave trade. I mean, the two most popular things to teach at Key Stage 3 is the slave trade and the American Civil Rights Movement, okay? And we don't teach the latter. So what kind of experience are our Key Stage 3 students that aren't going to take history for GCSE going to get a black history by the time we leave Johnny Boys? You know, it's, it's, that's it's not good enough. Um, so now what this means is when we teach this and we teach about uh, Mansa Musa, so the richest man in the world, and we teach about the kind of civilization, the culture, Timbuktu, um, you know, what we're giving the students is, is perspective and, and the world how it actually was. You know, you can see what Africa was like, this grand, this rich, wealthy, advanced civilization. So when they do look at the slave trade and when we look at the British Empire in Africa, they've got that perspective. Because if they haven't got that, then, then how are they going to know any different? Um, so that's, so we're really, <laughs> so really pleased with uh, how we're doing with that and, and we look forward to seeing how it goes next year. Um, and year eight, we do the Mughal Empire, which, which I, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have known anything about the Mughal Empire. And now it is a, it's a personal favorite for me. And um, I, I love teaching it. And I would encourage anybody with the Key Stage 3 History curriculum to do at least one unit on an Islamic empire, simply because um, the Islamic empires at the time, the Ottomans, the Mughals, they were, they acted, they were, they were, for the time, they were such tolerant societies and they kind of formed an umbrella for different people's cultures, faiths, um, in comparison to the West, which were, which was, um, which is the opposite. Um, you know, you know, not not diverse at all, and and, and very, uh, I can't think of the word, but um, you know, quite the opposite, intolerant. There we go. Um, and and it's got such a rich, and simply because of that, by studying the Mughal Empire, for example, it's got such a rich cultural and diverse history. Um, so, for instance, um, when we teach you, we look at um, Nur Jahan, who was um, the Empress, uh, the wife of uh, Jahangir. And because Emperor Jahangir was, uh, was he was essentially, he was, he was, he was, a, he was a bit of a drunk and he was, he was kind of quite dosed up on opium. And it meant that Nur Jahan essentially was de facto ruler of the whole Mughal Empire for, for tens of years and did a terrific job, according to um, some historians. Um, and it means we can also look at um, so Rani Dahabi, who was uh, the leader of the Maratha tribe that fought against the Mughal Empire, for, and she she ruled huge areas of southern India for for you know tens of years. So um, it's a rich female history, and also just just the religious aspect as well, because because they had this umbrella where you could practice religions freely for most of the Mughal Empire at the time it was there. So, for example, Akbar the Great, a uh, really interesting guy. He he was deeply interested in religion. He was a Sunni Muslim, but he used to have weekly debates, theological discussions, where he used to invite. Um, people from all faiths, so Christians, Hindus, um, Zoroastrians, uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, and he used to just listen to what they've got to say, and they used to debate about it every week. He used to drive um, the Muslim scholars mad, but he was so so tolerant. Um, 
and that you know they, they took Hindu brides um, to, to, to mix the royal bloodlines. And, and actually, his son Jahangir actually had uh, three of his nephews um, baptized by Jesuit priests. So it's just a it's just a very interesting thing to look at. Um, and also, what eventually happens uh, is Emperor Aurangzeb will take over in, in the latter part of the empire, and he actually begins to change all that and becomes very intolerant. Um, I mean, of course, quite strict religion, um, Muslim rule. Um, and he was known, for example, for boiling Sikhs alive for refusing to convert to Islam. Uh, but when, when you look at that, you can then go back and look at what the Tudors were like in their religion. You can compare Mary I burning people alive, Protestants alive, with how it's, you know, what's happening in the Mughal Empire. So it's, it's such an interesting period of history. Um, and what it means also is when you come to look at the British Empire, we look at the case of those of India and Africa, you know, the students have already got a rich knowledge then of what India was like and what Africa was like before the British took over. So they've got that perspective of, of kind of Britain's relationship with the world and, and the good and the bad, um, which is again about perspective is so important. Um, okay, so I think I've, 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 I've spoken for quite a while there, so I'm probably going to, have to wrap it up there. But I'll just finish by saying, um, so it's, it's quite a different experience talking at people for about curriculum because it's so much more valuable to, to, to talking with people and having a debate about it. It really opens your mind. Um, I'd like to credit, I uh, forgot actually, Claire Hollis and Will Bailey Watson who put together some really excellent free CBD on the curricularium, which informs my thinking around this. Um, and I think the thing to remember is that this is this is not a model curriculum, and curriculum is always changing. Um, you know, I'm very lucky to have a really motivated, skilled team of colleagues working with me um, to develop this kind of thing. And, and be brave and be bold and pick units that maybe you don't know anything about, but uh, but you know are going to benefit. It's going to benefit your students. Um, so I think you have got to be quite brave with that sometimes. Um, you know, um, and I think our school vision and humanities vision at Chorney, you know, references education as a vehicle for social justice and about supporting students to make positive contributions in society. I think developing an inclusive curriculum like we're trying to do is essential for building an inclusive society. Um, so I, I hope you found it useful and you can take some ideas away from that. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Henry. That was um, fantastic. Um, Jen is going to add a bit more on history as well. I know there is some questions in the chat box. You can come to them um, at the end of Jen's presentation as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I'm Jennifer Mills and I'm assistant head teacher at Chorney Girls and I'm the senior link for, for history, as Adam's sort of explained. Um, and I was acting head of history um, for the last year. Um, so in a similar way to as Henry has said about the context of the boys school, um, you know, we have a high proportion of uh, disadvantaged students, um, we have a high proportion of, of BAME students and um, obviously we're, we're a girls school 11 to 16. So that's just a little bit about the context of the school. Um, and really, um, we, we sort of in the department, um, you know, looking at the Black Lives Matter, um webinar and also so just having really think about having a conversation um and i just really want to acknowledge a few people here particularly sarah gillen our new head of history at the school uh, and and um I'm, I'm really lucky to work with a really talented uh, bunch of people but also other colleagues across the trust that i have been able to talk to about this um, and so really we were sort of thinking about okay some of the changes that we we could make to our curriculum uh, and and just thinking about how to do that in a meaningful uh, and uh, a manageable way. Um, and a really useful phrase from the Historical Association is this, this idea of slotting in stories of uh, diversity rather than kind of bolting them on. And as Lorraine Hughes has said, obviously there is that, that danger of being sort of tokenistic um, with the curriculum. And I think this is something that is going to sort of be enhanced and, and evolve over the, the next few years. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is just outline a couple of things that we're doing in the department and that we've been working on over the last year and that we will be doing in, in, in the next in the coming year. And just really to kind of acknowledge that we are we are learning and developing and sort of listening to, to different um, CPD that's out there, really. Um, so um, like sort of lots of schools and um, we have a chronological uh, key stage three, we do have a, a three year uh, key stage three uh, and see actually for uh, depth of study and particularly and um, that gives us an advantage I think in the 20th century that we are able to do um, a lot of work for example on like the 1960s which other schools perhaps um, have had to, to reduce. Um, so one of the first things we, we, we've done as the department is we've audited what we do and we've looked at the inquiry questions that, that, that we currently have um, one of the main things that we want to do is have a focus on migration uh, throughout Key Stage 3 and the stories and the testimonies of the past that come with, with migration. 
So, um, so you know, when we're looking at the Middle Ages, well, actually, what kind of part did migrants play in, in English life? And um, looking at the Middle Ages as well, how was how? And as Henry's obviously talked a lot about this, um, but how was life different uh, in in other cities around the world and in the Islamic Empire uh, as well as in Britain? Uh, when we were auditing, uh, what we do in the department, we were looking at diversity in its kind of broadest sense. And we, what, when we were thinking about Black Lives Matters uh, and some of the uh, so what we can do there, um, it actually also raised the issue that actually perhaps we don't look enough at um, the, the stories of those with disabilities within history as well. So one of our aims this year is to uh, increase what we do, what we do there. So, um, so I think that was a really useful process, actually, because, of course, once you're when you're looking for one uh, group in society, often it, it, it shows up other issues of, of diversity um, as well. So there's just a few uh, things there that, that we look at. Um, when uh, Henry and I were sort of planning sessions, um, he focused a lot on the first half of Kisei Shireen. So I'm going to talk more about the, the, the latter half. So uh, to try and avoid too much uh, repetition. Um, so another thing that we've looked at as a department is actually uh, talking about our vision for diversity with, within the department and having a statement for that. Um, and one of, the, one of the things is um, talking about um, immigration and the emigration of people and how this has sort of formed part of the story of Britain since prehistoric times. And this is not something that's new or, or only uh, relevant for the modern world. And of course, diversity is also relevant to the interpretation of history because different ethnic and social groups are, are going to have different interpretations of past events as well. Um, so this has always been a part of history. Um, people's experiences in the past have varied according to their ethnicity, class, gender or, or their sexuality. Um, so studying diversity helps to enable pupils to understand those complex issues um, of the past and is, is, is you know, obviously of, of, um, of huge importance. And I think a really good example of this is that Key Stage 4, <clears throat> when we look at um, the American West. Um, of course, you've got one group of people, of, of white Americans, moving to the West um, and really believing that what they're doing is, 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 in, uh, is in God's uh, wishes, it's, it's their destiny to uh, prove up the land and to, to farm it. And of course, the experience of a minority group uh, you know, with the Native Americans, um, who of course interpreted that same event as being destruction of, of nature and, and the world, um, and, and that fine balance between uh, between people and nature. So um, that's a good example, actually, of how um, people's uh, position and, and their social group has an influence on how they interpret the same the same events at the time. Um, so that's one of the, the things that we, we look at. Um, I, I, another thing that we're discussing at the moment is how. Uh, we have an influence in the wider curriculum and so like, for example with Black History Month what do we want it to look like and my colleague Rachel Henwood did a, a good job this year of, uh, of running a, a competition um, for Black History Month looking at the role of, um, of black people in history uh, you know for everything from science to, to, to politics um, so and again I think that links in with discussions recently about how we don't want to just have um, a curriculum where the only time we're talking about black history is actually when we're talking about the, the slave trade um, but it, perhaps we want to go further this year with that and look at um, diversity uh, in a broader sense and perhaps look more at the history of, of, of South Asians as, as well within that. Um, this week, we've got a cultural capital and wellbeing week in school. And so the department for the activities for that is focused on uh, local history and, and the culture of the local community. So the students are looking at their own family tree and their own their own history, which is something that when we talk about cultural capital, it's really important to acknowledge actually the culture that exists within the community that, that we teach. Um, another thing I wanted to sort of discuss is when we're sort of teaching history, of course, it's not just what we teach, it's where our starting point is. And, and if we are to start the teaching of the Holocaust, for example, um, looking at you know, the, the, the mass graves and looking at the concentration camps, then we are perpetuating that uh, that that narrative of, of the Nazis actually, uh, there's a danger that, that, that we are, we are doing that because the Nazis obviously were dehumanising uh, people, and by by teaching just from that point, you're not putting the human in the story. And if there's a danger with the slave trade as well. If we just go straight to the story of of slaves um, and the the, the 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 terrible things that happen to people, that again we're not talking about um, the human story there. Um, so instead. 
uh, what, we're, what we're doing in the department and what we have been doing for the last few years is, is actually looking at pre, uh, pre-war Jewish life um, and also looking at Africa and looking at the civilization before colonization, which has been mentioned um, today a, a few times. Um, and in, in a related way as well, I think it's really important that we acknowledge Britain's role in the transatlantic slave trade, um, you know, with things with, like with Bristol and the ports, because of course, if, um, and I think there is a tendency within history that to go straight to the story of the plantations um, or of the middle passage. Uh, and then of course, then we're actually sort of almost um, just sort of skipping over uh, Britain's part in that, in that story and going straight to the part about America. So also making sure that we do focus you know, on, on the, the three parts uh, to that slave triangle. Um, I think when we're talking about diversity as well and, and different individuals in the past, it's important that we, we talk about active uh, people as well as and that people are not presented as passive. So again, in a similar way to when we talk about Jews, we, we talk about Jewish citizens actively resisting the Nazis and we look at influential women there as well. Um, so like Rosa Rubossa who um, destroyed a crematorium. Uh, but also looking at, and Henry's mentioned this as well, the slaves' active role in the abolition of slavery, for example, the role of Equiano and the Haitian Revolution, as well as the role of white males um, such as Wilberforce. So people's role in, in changing their own uh, circumstances. Um, but the world wars as well, of course, offer a lot of opportunity to look at different narratives and interpretations where you're looking at uh, the diversity of soldiers, for example, in um, the army. So there are lots of opportunities there where it's a manageable thing to slot in different uh, stories and increase diversity uh, in a way that is meaningful. And, and this links back to my point earlier, really, about talking about disability. And again, there's opportunities there after uh, World War One and after World War Two. Actually, what was the experience of, of people returning to civilian life with disabilities? Um, and, and so there's a, again a really important opportunity to talk about the different experiences of lots of, of people. And the 1960s, so when we're looking at that, um, you know, there are so many different stories there of minority groups um, being part of leading revolution and change. So looking at um, the LGBTQ plus community and the Stonewall riots and looking at civil rights, the civil rights movement as well, which we do teach um, at, the girl, at the girls' school. Um, but also the women's liberation movement. And this is really helps actually with Key Stage 4 as well, because there's a lot of support there for the Key Stage 4 unit, like when we're looking at crime and punishment and the changes around abortion law and divorce, divorce law, um, which actually link in with some of those activities that happen in uh, 1960s, as well as the decriminalisation of homosexuality as well, which comes up on the crime and punishment unit. And the Windrush movement as well is something that we want to focus more on in the department. And by looking at the 20th century, uh, and looking at it in that broader sense of different social groups, we're able to do that. But there's a really nice opportunity there to look at the local history as well um, and the, the influence of that group of people on, on Bedford and Luton. Um, the, the, here's a couple of books and um, some reading and research that we've been looking at in the department. Um, and there's uh, so just a couple of suggestions there. Um, and really that's um, the main thing for me. Um, so, but if anyone has any uh, questions about any of that, then I'm um, obviously happy to, to talk about it at the end. But really just a concluding kind of thoughts really is that um, I think it's really important. I think Henry said this as already with history that when we're talking about the past, that we're providing opportunities to look at people that have had influence. I mean, one of our, our, our mottos really at the school is to develop influential women of the future. Um, so it's really important that the girls actually see those stories in the past and they see their community rep represented and they see um, opportunities um, for inspiration really. So, thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Jen. Um, just before we move on to the Q&A, um, we've got Ian Stonnell has just joined us from Denby. Um, he's ass Assistant Head of Denby RE Specialist. And the reason I've asked him to come along and speak today is because um, he's written a blog about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and he just wanted to speak a little bit about that. Oh, have, hello, everybody. Sorry, I couldn't be here from the start. Uh, we've still sh got students coming into Denby that I've been registering this morning. 
Um, but yeah, I can talk quickly. Really, it's just about thoughts. You know, when we're in lockdown, um, we were thinking about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and what was happening. So I wrote a blog piece really just thinking about the main issues, like why are we having these protests now? And what does it mean for education? And what has been simmering for quite a while, really? Um, what do we need to do as educators to really think about it? So I wrote a short blog. Um, I'll try and share it with you now. Can I do that, Adam? Yeah, yeah. Share the, uh... yeah. And so, yeah, essentially we're talking about like what the main issues are. So obviously in education, one of the big um, sort of changes when we had curriculum reforms back in the early 2010s there we go. was, you know, you can see that a perceived, uh, you can see it now, good, uh, with the sort of perceived narrowing of the curriculum to sort of uh, follow a kind of more nationalistic approach, especially when you looked at things like the English curriculum. Um, some people accuse the curriculum of being whitewashed, looking at white deceased male writers and the diversity being reduced there. Um, and the similar sort of process happening in the history curriculum, you know, how we had this narrowed focus. Now, what the argument for that was, was about cultural capital in a sense, but a very sort of British cultural capital. Um, the argument being that if everybody from different backgrounds uh, had the same cultural capital to sort of relate to, then that could reduce inequality by people being part, being able to have those conversations, know about the history of this country, know about the culture about this country. Obviously, uh, what uh, that was the problem with that was disenfranchisement of diversity. So diverse groups, um, uh, you know, BAME history uh, figures that weren't part of that curriculum. So obviously what we're seeing now in some extent is a sort of a backlash against that. We are not telling those diverse stories how we should be. Now the argument is that actually there is scope within our curriculums now to actually sort of broaden that and we've really got to think about how can we broaden that. So in history, in English, in RE, in all these subjects, in science, how can we uh, broaden um, the diversity in what we teach. So how can we expose our students to their own narratives and their own history and place themselves within um, uh, this uh, society that we live in? So the question is, how can we do that? Um, we're looking in some ways. So in uh, RE and uh, um, what we're trying to do is think about how we can get students to understand how history affects our are present. So when we look to the protests and the statues being removed and what's going on, it's actually an echo of empire in the past and how that is relating to today. So in history, how much do we teach about the colonial past, warts and all, um, how that has led to the diversity in this country and how that's led to perhaps the inequalities that we see today and where we can move forward in the future. So we're really having so those deep questions about how we can change the curriculum to teach those concepts. Um, also in other areas, we're thinking about how we can broaden that diversity of students' uh, uh, experiences and that history. So, I mean, I can share that blog for people to read through in terms of that curriculum. I'm sure just hearing with Jen about what they're doing in history and all those areas we can move forward. The other side, is that look at the the leadership debate really and the diversity of voices uh, designing curriculums and, and um, you know thinking about creating that future curriculum that we're teaching do we have enough diversity in those voices you know perhaps one of the criticisms of what uh, Michael Gove and uh, those decision makers made was their lack of diversity it was a lot of white male voices making decisions about curriculum that were ignoring the, the diverse voices of um, our society. Um, so obviously that is an area of change. How can we make sure those voices are heard? How can we include as many voices as possible? And that's a leadership um, debate and a leadership uh, question about that. And obviously we, we see we're doing a lot of uh, CPD within the trust and aims to you know uh, get more diverse leadership. Um, but what can we do now in terms of making sure we find out about those voices? So we need to do a lot of research. We need to do a lot of reading, especially in RE history and English departments about how we can uh, make things more inclusive. Um, sorry, really, I can't say much more than that. I, I've been busy this morning, but uh, that's what I have to say at the moment, Adam. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks a lot for that, Ian.
Um, so you can stick around to answer any questions if people got questions about it. Um, okay, so I'm going to open up the Q and A now for um, if anyone's got any questions. I'll start with. There's a couple already in the chat box that um, have sort of been touched on a little bit that we might want to expand on. Um, I noticed there was a little dialogue between Ian Hayden and a colleague about a, the balance between a key stage two and key stage three curriculum. Um, Ian, can you just explain sort of how you sort of manage that in your role at Denby? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a debate that most humanities departments are, are having about the key stage two, uh, uh, the key stage three, two year or three year curriculum. Um, I think for us, it's just ensuring that our schemes of learning are, are extremely efficient. Um, it is challenging to teach everything in the national curriculum in two years, but it is also achievable uh, as long as the kind of direction of travel is clear. In terms of how it links to the kind of inclusive curriculum agenda, for me personally, because the way the geography national curriculum is structured, there is enough scope for a teacher to, to teach an inclusive curriculum within the guidance from the national curriculum in geography. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I've got to say on that, Adam, really. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. I think, as, as you said, that's sort of an ongoing debate in schools. We've just got to find the balance there, haven't we, between, between the two. Um, the other question I noticed in the chat box was from Luke Davis. He sort of directed it towards Henry, but we can open it up to any of the panellists. Um, he said, how did the, the head of humanities, how do the subjects um, fit in with your inclusive curriculum? And the other part of that is how do you support the subject knowledge required for the curriculum changes that you're making? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll take the last question first. So subject knowledge is, is key and it is, um, it's very difficult to build. And I think it comes very much from the team dynamic, um, you know, within, his, within all the subjects in humanities. I think the teachers we've got were very passionate about their subjects. And it's not that you don't want to read about it. It's not that you don't want to research about it. It's actually finding the time to do it. And you can manage that by signposting, you know, it's texts or, or blogs that are important, you think are important for your department to lead. You've got to really lead on that. Um, and also what I'd say is, I'll take Samir Richards as an example, who's a history teacher here, and um, he will do the lessons himself. So he, so he understands he's got the knowledge. Um, Steph, Steph, who I know you're watching, Steph, but you know, she, she's modeled loads of these meanwhile elsewhere homeworks that we use to broaden our curriculum in history. And just by, by doing that and putting it together, you enhance your subject knowledge. Um, something else that you did, Steph, this year was uh, this, this thing called not in the textbook. So in our department meetings every week, somebody would have to present on a bit of historical knowledge, which they're strong on, which the rest of the department are not. And so it's, it's a gradual process, but I think, um, you know, it's finding time and little, little things like that to build that subject knowledge up um, and, and, and having that enthusiasm. So the only reason we teach the Mughal Empire actually is because of um, Harry Shafi's suggestion. And, and he brought in a book from SHP and uh, we were kind of spellbound by it. Well, I was anyway. <laughs> I don't know about you, sir. Um, and that kind of uh, it drove our enthusiasm to learn about the subjects and, and then teach it. Um, as, as for humanities, I, I think we have really tried to, to sequence the learning throughout humanities. So we, we kind of all support each other. So in our re, you know, you do look at World War One, um, and we look at conscientious objectors, and you can look at the role of, um, of religion, for example, for Muslim soldiers, and that kind of supports what we then do in history. Uh, maybe it gives us a chance to look at a different perspective. So, you know, maybe it's okay for us to look at British soldiers on the Western Front because, you know, we know that they're covering the role of Muslim soldiers um, in RE. So it's about looking carefully at what you're offering because actually if you, if you kind of coordinate it effectively um, and organise it, then you can make sure it's inclusive across the whole faculty. I think with that overview, it makes it easier to do that. Um, I'll just share something with you, which my head of geography was talking to me about the other day, which I, I think is hiding in plain sight. I think we all know about it, but he kind of just made a point that, when you look at the map of the world and he kind of looks at the, the size of the countries and how it wasn't really how it actually was and how kind of North America can almost fit into the whole continent of Africa. And it's just these, these kind of things that I think he makes students aware of, which, which challenges that, um, that perception of how the world actually is. Um, I, I think within geography, I know Andrew does case studies on, for example, Africa, Brazil, China. Um, and, then, and then when we do our work on Africa, they've got a kind of you know, base knowledge which we can um, develop that with. I think I think it's been a really useful um, dialogue, and I think we do want it, we do want this to be an ongoing thing. We do want people to be sharing um, ideas over the next academic year, really. 
um, we are we are going to be running another session on this later on, and um, probably in the autumn term, and um, maybe after Christmas. Um, I know things are crazy busy at the moment, getting ready for September. Um, if there, as I said, if there is anything that you want from any of the contributors today, they've said they're more than happy to contribute and share ideas. And um, if you would like the slides to be shared with you, if you can just pop your email address in the chat box before you leave, um, I will um, put all the slides together from our contributors and we can share them out by email um, today. Okay, so thank you very much.